good evening friends uh, manish mentioned that uh, bca is, is a family and i'm part of the family so whatever manish said is a related party transaction and so you need to take it with pinch of salt um manish uh, when he mentioned that this is a topic that let's uh, talk about it um take a lecture on uh, the topic of technology and i was wondering what do i speak on technology because at one hand uh, one of our members uh, mentioned that you know you need to uh, talk about impact of technology on our profession somebody said what should be an ideal it organization in a firm and i thought these are uh, micro questions and i think we need to understand what's happening at a slightly um, you know conceptual level in terms of technology growth and uh, at the end of this session uh, one thing i can guarantee that uh, you may leave with more questions than you may have walked in here with uh, at the same time i can uh, also uh, you know assure you that it will be a th thought provoking uh, session i'm uh, dividing this presentation into three parts uh, in the first part i'll talk about uh, just a summary or an overview of the exponential growth in technology that we have seen in the second part i'll be uh, talking about uh, uh, various actual life cases uh, uh, where the technology is being deployed and how uh, real life businesses are benefiting from the advancements in the technology and in the third part i'll talk about um, what is in it for the professions at large and when we talk about professions at large doctors architects everybody is included and whatever is uh, you know going to be impacting one uh, profession would also impact us so there would be of course few pointers about specific to our profession but it will be a macro picture that i'll uh, paint well friends um, few years ago i came across a book called uh, Revol uh, revolutionary wealth that has been written by alvin toffler alvin toffler was one of the early futurist and um, in 2005 he wrote this book in which uh, in one of the uh, chapters he is written about clash of speeds and uh, there he is uh, talking about how in a society various parts are moving at different uh, speed and that is actually creating the chasm within the society so uh, alvin toffler refers to the speed of business just a minute in a technology lecture there has to be some technology challenge so in this 2005 book he says that business is changing and he compared this uh, with the um, with the rate of uh, speed at which say an automobile is traveling on the on the highway just a minute let me adjust this from my machine so he compares this uh, with the speed of automobile so business is uh, racing past at 100 miles an hour and when you compare that to the speed of various other uh, components of the society then alvin says that the families are changing at like 60 miles an hour uh, the uh, regulatory and uh, bureaucracy is uh, you know changing at 25 miles an hour uh, the school system is changing at 10 miles an hour so imagine how a school system or education system which is changing at 10 miles an hour will be capable of preparing students uh, to join business which are changing at 100 miles an hour in fact within our own uh, uh, you know circle we have an example uh, bhavin turakya uh, son of uh, one of our uh, chartered accountant member uh, he took admission into iit and found that what is being taught in iit is out of date so he dropped out can you imagine somebody getting admission in iit and dropping out because he felt that and today he owns uh, you know uh, a large business so and of course the judiciary government and, and alvin doesn't have good words about them so he says that they are changing at the rate of something like 2 and 5 miles an hour so that's the problem that we have 
and i think similar uh, uh, you know uh, differences you will see within the profession within the society so let's look at the quantum jump jumps in the uh, technology that we have witnessed all of us would be uh, familiar with or we would have heard about moore's law right um, gordon moore who was uh, co-founder of intel he in 1965 predicted that the number of components on a integrated circuit will, do will double every two years which is like a uh, 40% uh, cagr and this law has held true for a number of years so you see uh, from a transit transistor count of 2 today we are talking about 7 billion uh, transistors in fact intel is now talking about um, packing 100 million plus transistors on each square millimeter of a chip and uh, forget about computers even apple's a13 which is uh, iphone 11 pro has 8.5 billion transistors and amd's latest microprocessor on that small chip we can even look at the evolution of uh, storage uh, i remember my early days where we had those 5 and a quarter inch uh, floppy disks of 360 kb to start with then we had those 3 uh, and a half inch uh, disk of 1.44 uh, uh, mb and and you know those were the days uh, one had to manage uh, even those who were writing programs my wife is here and she used to do programming and she would say that one had to manage writing programs in a way that uh, you know the uh, cpu uh, uh, ram used to be something like you know 360 kb or 256 and then it went up to 1 point something and, and so on so uh, those were the days and today where we have come today the data size is grown not only from kb to mb to gb to tb now it is moving to petabyte exabyte zettabyte and yottabyte to 10 is 1 kb 2 raised to 20 is 1 mb 2 raised to 30 is 1 gb and so yottabyte would be 2 raised to 80 or 90 i am not too sure in 2018 international data corporation estimated the global data sphere has reached 33 zettabytes and about 90% of this data has been generated in the last 2 years we now generate about 2 and 1/2 uh, exabytes of new data every day as a world and this the total size of data is uh, expected to uh, reach uh, 175 zettabytes by 2025 and out of this incremental data two third data will be generated by internet of things 49% of the data will remain in public cloud and out of that 30% data will need real thing so exponential growth so uh, along with moore's law there is another law which is being attributed to bill gates uh, and also amara um, charles amara uh, which says that we always overestimate the change that will occur in next 2 years and underestimate the change that will occur in next 10 so if you see the graph how things have been changing in fact the example is you know very well uh, amplified by this uh, particular picture what used to take so much of space and so many gadgets now for small time devices which all of you are most likely carrying today so you know that is the kind of change that we are seeing uh, moore's law uh, there has been a lot of discussion that is it outdated is it no longer valid because you know the kind of growth that we are seeing uh has really slowed down in terms of the number of transistors that are growing but then what i came across is nevin's law hamid nevin who's a uh, director of uh, quantum artificial intelligence at google he says that now the growth will come on a, at at a double exponential rate and he says that it's like 2 raised to 2 raised to 1 then 2 raised to 2 raised to 2 and so on so it will be doubly exponential rate and at this rate 
they are saying that the changes that we will see in next 10 years will far outstrip the changes that we have seen in last 40 years. We will definitely see some of the examples as well. Uh, and one of the things which is actually uh, driving the change is the explosion in sensors. So we had our first, so camera is also a sensor in a way, uh, and the first digital camera was invented by Kodak. Uh, Steven Sassoon at Kodak was the inventor of the first digital camera. It was very unfortunate that Kodak didn't realize the value of that and they couldn't capitalize on it, and we'll talk about that as well. But one of the first, um, you know, sensor was, uh, or IoT in a way example, was when John Romke connected a Sunbeam uh, toaster to the internet. That was way back in 1989. And Neil Gross has, uh, uh, you know, he, he uh, analyzed the situation. He says that next century planet Earth will dawn an electrical skin. It will use the internet as a scaffold to support and transmit its sensations. Look at the uh, uh, look at the sensors that we have today. We have sensors for everything today: proximity, ambient light sensor, imagers, GPS, accelerometer. You name it: temperature sensor, pressure, fingerprint sensor, gyroscope, and what are the uses? There are you know more than 20, 30 sensors embedded in a single smartphone. As the IoT Internet of Things will reach new height, Google is developing a range of internal as well as external sensors monitoring everything from blood sugar to blood chemistry. And we will see uh, what impact it will have on the health, health services. The multi-million dollar uh, medical devices, the MRI machines and whatnot will now get dematerialized in the sense the same way the uh, you know, cameras and other equipments got dematerialized and they become be, they have become part of our smartphone. Even the large medical devices will become part of our smartphone. It will become portable. It will become wearable. And already you see a lot of those uh, watches uh, which are already performing a lot of these functions. Stanford uh, researchers estimate that by 2030 we will have 500 billion connected devices on this earth. 500 billion devices and this will translate into approximately 14 trillion economy so you can imagine how the whole uh, thing is changing what we are seeing is an exponential growth increasing capability so you have big data you have ability to solve problem Watson IBM's Watson was in 1997 one of the first uh, machine that actually bit uh, the uh, you know best of the individuals who are competing on the quiz show famous American quiz show today you have computers that can even detect emotions so whether you're smiling is it a genuine affectionate smile or is it a fake uh, just a social smile robotics the autonomous vehicles cars and we'll talk about that as well it's becoming all pervasive. Everything that you touch will have component of technology and most importantly, it is connected. Everything is connected. Let's see what impact it is having on the, on the industry. So here is a small clip that talks about industrial revolution. So the business is now talking about industrial revolution 4.0. This has been discussed at uh, the uh, uh, World Economic Forum. History class taught us about the Industrial Revolution, when steam power changed how things were manufactured. But there hasn't been just one Industrial Revolution. The manufacturing industry has reinvented itself many times. The first Industrial Revolution is the familiar one. Beginning in the late 18th century, manufacturers used steam engines and hydraulic power in factories to make production more efficient. The second revolution began in the late 19th century when electricity and assembly lines made mass production possible. The third took off in the 60s when advances in computing enabled us to program machines and networks. Today, we're at the beginning of a fourth industrial revolution. Industry 4.0 is about connecting the digital and physical worlds. 
Today, most manufacturers' key assets are a part of the physical world. The workers, machines, tools, and inventories that drive both the production process and the end product that customers use every day. But emerging technologies allow manufacturers to use data produced by these physical assets to drive insights based on data. These technologies will enable the construction of new solutions to some of the oldest and toughest challenges manufacturers face in growing and operating their businesses. Eliminating unplanned downtime in the factory. Ensuring you never start work on the production floor that can't be finished with the material, labor, and machines you have on hand. Tripling the leverage you get from costly support labor and specialized tech talent. Changing the dynamics of your channel and creating new sources of revenue. Enabling your products to sell services for you. Growing your data business as big as your product business. Using customer and channel connectivity to achieve unprecedented levels of customer service. And the changes for the industry as a whole will be even broader, as broad as we've seen in past revolutions. Industry 4.0 will change the basis of competition, alter how manufacturers win customers, shake up the structure of the manufacturing industry, and give you the opportunity to make history. So this is all coming out of the convergence of various um, technologies, um, IoT, artificial intelligence, robots, drones, autonomous vehicles, 3D printing, cloud computing, nanotechnology, and more. In fact, Rolls-Royce, um, you know, the giant uh, conglomerate that we know, it, it is also into aerospace engines and power systems. They have applied IoT to predict data analytics and business model innovation to shift from selling aircraft engines to selling engine uptime. For an airline, it is important that there is a uptime of the engine. So instead of just plain selling engine, they are saying we will guarantee you engine, engine uptime with reliability and predictive maintenance, uh, which is the core need of any airline. So you see, uh, even the uh, distinction between product and services is blurring with the help of technology. Interestingly, I came across uh, a startup by MIT graduates, Arman Advani and Gihan Amarasi Vardena, uh, looks like a Sri Lankan name. They are using 3D printing to make better, more sustainable clothes. So you will have not only software as a service SaaS, but now you have product as a service pass. Um, so some of my, uh, you know, uh, material here is based on uh, Peter uh, Diamandis. He is a friend of um, uh, Tesla's founder uh, and also uh, founder of Singularity University with which uh, we have a collaboration. He's just about uh, seven or ten days ago published a book called uh, The Future is Fasting. Um, and he says this, that the rate of technological change is accelerating so fast that our ability to understand the implication of it has never been so challenging and so important. So R Richard Foster says that the average lifespan of a company listed on uh, S&P 500 has significantly decreased. In 1920s, this was 67 years. Today, a company is part of that S&P 500 only for 15 years. In next 10 years, 40% of Fortune 500 companies will be gone out of the business. That's one research. A surprising truth, uh, today everybody is talking about jobs and, and lack of uh, jobs. The surprising truth as per one research is that in the last 25 years, almost all private sector jobs have been created by businesses which are less than 5 years old. Today, in, as of January, 31st January 2020, we have 600 unicorns in the world. Unicorn was a term co coined by Aileen Lee, which is the private business that have attained a valuation of a billion dollars or more. So they started with 39, count of 39 in 2013. And in seven years, we have 600 unicorns. 
India has a unicorn uh, count of 39 as of today. You have Ola Bhavish Agarwal. In 2010, he was working with Microsoft, and he took one uh, ride to go to the um, uh, park just outside Bangalore. I think Baner Ghatta Road. Say you go uh, to that park, and the uh, hired cab ditched him on the way. Say, nahi jaunga. And and he thought, what can I do? And he came up with Ola. Today, Ola is valued at five billion dollars. But then, at that time, when he resigned from Microsoft job and decided to set up Ola, his parents were most worried that ye kya? you're leaving a Microsoft job and becoming what travel agent? Today, you have Policy Bazaar, Oyo, Freshworks, Flipkart, Snapdeal, Quicker, Hike, Baiju's. Flipkart no longer is part of uh, Unicorn because it's been now acquired by Walmart, which is a listed company. So, this is what we see. Google and Facebook together command more advertising dollars than all print media on the planet. Google now processes approximately 7 to 10 billion searches every day. E-commerce in 2017 they reached 2.3 trillion dollars and is estimated at about 3.5 trillion dollars as of 2019. Facebook has 2.27 billion dollars, I mean users, 2.27 billion users. So the growth has been amazing. Today approximately you have, so as of January 5th, 2020, there were 4.437 billion, 4 billion plus internet users spanning the globe out of the total population of 8 billion plus human beings on this planet earth. In last two years, as we, I mentioned already, nine, nine times more data has been created than the entire history of humanity. Now imagine from 4 billion uh, connected uh, individuals, in next few years, we will have, as they predict, by 2025, every single human being on this earth will be connected. Everybody will have a smartphone. So imagine when you have additional 4.2 billion minds connected, what will they discover? What will they consume? What new companies will they build? Which industries will they disrupt? So we are seeing already an unprecedented acceleration of network growth and connectivity. But only other, one half of the planet is connected. Imagine when the other half also comes into play. So there is no finishing line. Ray Kurzweil, he says that by 2023, we will have a $1,000 laptop which will perform 10 raised to 16 calculations per second. 10 raised to 16, which is roughly equivalent to one human brain. In 25 years thereafter, the same very average laptop, so by somewhere around 2050, same average laptop, one laptop, will have the power of all human brains put together on this planet. He says that, Ray says that we will experience a 100 year progress in 21st century. It's not the case. It's not that in 21st century we will have a 100 year of progress. He says that we will witness the progress that otherwise would have taken 20,000 years. So this is what we are you know, gearing up for, which is going to be paradigm shifting, game changing, Nothing is ever the same again breakthrough. I can actually go on and on, you know, there are several forces which are uh, making this possible. We have uh, looked at all of them, save time, availability of capital, but one very interesting, uh, you know, force that is happening is geniuses who were earlier extraordinary individuals who were earlier not able to shine, not able to come up because they were casualties of either class, country, culture, no longer. 
in fact uh, diamond is talks about ramanujam so we have one ramanujam but how many ramanujams could not come up so you already have uh, the case of vasishtha narayan singh in bihar you may have recently read about him he has been awarded padma shri posthumously so with crowd economy free data smartness everywhere transformation everywhere what will happen the 5g that is un, uh, you know unraveling it can be configured the power of 5g is going to be tremendous it's not just going from 4g to 5g in terms of 5g you it can be configured to a location specific need security is can be very high and it can be set up at any temporary location we have as of today approximately 200 uh, uh satellites in the low earth orbit uh, orbit this by just end of this year itself this 200 satellites will increase to 700 that's one prediction based on an analysis the artificial intelligence the progress that is made in artificial intelligence is amazing in fact um one of the comment we often hear is social media is making individuals dumb but the same very social media is making artificial intelligence much smarter the social media knows what needs you want what should be presented to you it's all coming out of artificial intelligence face id digital voice assistants all the siri and alexa maps that we use autonomous vehicles and i'll i'll talk more about that Uh, few years ago we were in tokyo and when we went to a store uh, it was very difficult to shop anything because everything was written in japanese and we were uh, you know absolutely not able to buy especially the food items because you don't know what is vegetarian and non vegetarian there's no green dot there today with your smartphone you have google translate app you point that app at any Uh, written material text in any other language it will automatically detect that language and translate that for you that's power of artificial intelligence in your hand robots i i but let's look at few of the examples of this technology harvard few years ago they started uh, online classes they started offering online programs and look at what happened in a single year they had more students than in their entire 379 year history in fact as per one uh, you have now 900 plus universities offering what is now called as mooc massive open online courses and there are more than 13 and 1/2000 courses 820 micro credentials and the degrees and today number of students registered on this open uh, classes is 11 crores you can imagine what will happen to education with the technology let's look at the health health web md where there are greater number of unique visits every month than to all the doctors working in the united states Stanford a team of Stanford researchers developed a system that can diagnose skin lesion whether it's cancerous or not from a photo as accurately as any other leading uh, dermatologist this is based on artificial intelligence powered by they have something like close to 2 lakh actual images stored in the machine and the uh, computer runs through a comparison with the database and they come out with their analysis an average doctor would not have more memory than 500 cases even at the peak of his career patients like me it's an online network of 600000 patients who come together and share their experience and learn from each other So here is one scenario on a wintry Wednesday in uh, 2026 you are being watched carefully watched 
technically you are asleep in your bed but google's home assistant knows your schedule thanks to your aura ring it also knows that you have j just completed a rem cycle and now are now entering stage 1 sleep making it perfect time to wake up a gentle increase in room's lighting stimulates the sunrise while optimized light wavelength maximizes wakefulness and improves your mood hey google how's my health this morning one moment says your digital assistant that's the that's the kind of uh, you know area we are going to get into and the ai enabled chip handheld ultrasound 3d imager image imager means you will soon soon be able to track everything from the wound healing to fetus growth from the comfort of your home i can go on and on on health but this is not on health let me talk about what's happening uh, to journalism for example associated press they have started using algorithms to produce their news reports specifically on earnings so you when you read that news report it's not written by human being it is written by a machine forbes now provides similar not only for earnings but also for sports la times uses that for earthquake reports Let's look at this in the field of legal profession. A system predicts the outcome of Supreme Court decisions as accurately as any legal scholar because it has a database of 200 years of cases. And each case they have parameterized on 240 variables. eBay uses an online the sport this uh, dispute resolution system so you don't need individuals to act as uh, arbitrators it's all through technology jp morgan uses this program called coin to scan commercial loan agreements in matters of second and it saves huge number of legal uh, time the solo legal lawyer is under threat The cooperative bank in England said that it will offer legal services from around 350 of its bank branches. Now, that's another point that I'm going to come to. That you know, how are the professions organized? How is the knowledge, specialist knowledge in societies, uh, produced and distributed? And that's also going to undergo change. Here is another example. This is a beautiful. um a uh, concert hall in hamburg germany it has 10000 panels each have unique size shape and they have um, they have been designed to shape the sound within the auditorium to the optimum no two panels absorb or scatter sound waves alike but together they create a balanced reverberation across the entire auditorium this entire auditorium was designed by algorithm and not by human beings i advise uh, a firm of architects in united states and when i was uh, discussing with one of the partners and he was telling me about them i came to know that one of their partner is a digital marketing professional and i said you are a firm of architects and you have a digital marketing professional as your partner he said yes when we design retail space it's no longer enough to design only from an architectural perspective we have to marry the digital world with the physical world so you have such congruence of even professions happening in management consulting mckinsey says that look we've done enough of uh, you know customized uh, consulting and it has a limit so they have come up with online products you describe your situation and you have a solution so it's a package solution which is something which you know as a consultant you can offer In fact even Deloitte offers analytics platform with a pre-integrated set of tools which are you know geared towards solving business problems and analytics accelerators that are proven and tested tools so that businesses get their consistency quality and value coming to our own tax profession so moody's did research on some of these companies and they came out with uh, an analysis that 
the tax simplification will accelerate the shift of consumers away from assisted tax providers to do it yourself diy options so you have intuit which today files almost 30% of total tax returns in the us were just filed by uh, one particular application and in some territories the tax authorities already require full accounts payable accounts receivable we are talking about e invoicing right this is not a new concept the tax authorities will go into transaction level level details you have to provide periodic trial balance financial ledgers everything it includes currently brazil poland france and spain this four countries require you to open your books of accounts on a periodic basis at a transaction level and these are required to be provided within 4 days of invoice issuance almost real time within 5 years there is a prediction that most tax authorities will be require will require fuller data sets to be filed and made available and in real time they are likely to go beyond that rather than require the data to be filed and managing transfer and storage of large volume of data they may simply mandate the algorithm routine so they will have access to your sap oracle or whatever maybe you can keep away out of their radar by being on tally but no longer so they will say that give us access our uh, analytical processes will run on your data set they'll do comparisons and they'll come out with their tax queries so obviously the skills and capabilities that will be required for a tax professional will be very different from what we have today it will require a blend of automation and augmentation of the workforce will have to be open to you know uh, having a blend of capability within our uh, teams in fact at times you know people question the multidisciplinary model and you know there are debates about large firms small firms and i find it's stupidity uh, in in getting stuck into this kind of debates and i'll come to that in a while uh, when we talk about the very existence of professions but you know is this all uh, you know kind of uh, uh, bad news no this will in fact increase the demand for tax professionals because there will be increased complexity rapid changes risk will be very high and the new technologies will have to be embraced you will have to analyze data obviously you have to become a business partner partner of the business teams to understand what the transactions are where they are going and how it impacts the company and when we are talking about various professions uh, technology is uh, you know not even sparing the god okay yeah sorry so i'll come to that before that this is one uh, survey uh, that uh, deloitte australia carried out which says that uh, you know percentage of people who say that uh, these are the skill sets that will be required in future uh, 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 you know circles show the current um, capability so 70% uh, believe that 70% will be requirement of understanding of big data and data analytics versus only 28% of um, respondents they say that they have some working knowledge of that 57% say that the digital uh, collaboration tools that skill set will be required versus only 20% say that oh that's what we have so coming to the subject of god technology does not even spare god so you have an online or rather uh, uh, an I iphone app where you can do your confessions you don't have to go to the church to record your confession in fact there was a controversy because this was actually um, released with an imprimatur uh, that the official recognition or endorsement from the church so there was a bishop kevin rhodes uh, in us who you know gave that imprimatur and so it is authorized by the church but vatican stated that look this cannot be a substitute for your physical visit so obviously they want to guard their uh, business as well 
let's see what's the future looking like in the field of transport in fact in 2011 the founder that's of time to go let's see how i'm getting home tonight Mobility managers use advanced analytics to combine Ben's trip history, current circumstances, data from millions of other commuters, and information from different modes of travel across the city to provide a set of tailored, seamless options. Payment providers allow Ben to pay by the mile. Insurance companies deliver customized per-trip insurance that accounts for Ben's particular route and mode of transit. I need groceries. I can pick them up at the station and then take a pod home, but I can still get some exercise by biking to the train. City planners work with the private sector to operate and maintain critical infrastructure from bike racks to train platforms. Physical assets are increasingly smart and connected, allowing constant real-time monitoring. Ah, perfect timing. And I don't even need to take my phone out of my pocket to board. Digital infrastructure suppliers provide ubiquitous, high-speed connectivity for a smooth and secure online experience. Milk, eggs, bread, ice cream? Yeah, why not? Retailers and logistics providers enable nearly on-demand provisioning of products to Ben. Well, I got my groceries. Now I just need to grab a pod and I can catch a bit of the game. Fleet operators autonomous, uh, store, vehicles. maintain, and deploy shared autonomous vehicles throughout the city. Vehicle manufacturers build an array of shared self-driving options to meet the varying needs of Ben and the millions of other travelers. Content providers offer a variety of options, from entertainment to business applications, each supported by advertisers and subscription fees. Wow, that was fast. Now I just check the fare summary, grocery bill, rate the trip, and it's time to relax. Does it look far-fetched? Uh, Peter Thiel, one of the very famous uh, investor, uh, technology investors in uh, US, in 2011, he made a very famous comment that, you know, we wanted flying cars. What did we get? 140 characters. Twitter, you know, reference to Twitter. And so, does this all sound very far-fetched? As we speak, you know, um, already uh, Uber is planning a network of flying cars in Dallas, Texas and Dubai in 2020 itself. The trial is happening right now. They call it uh, Uber Elevate. In fact, um, there is a Hyperloop. We have all heard about Hyperloop which is going to connect uh, uh, Mumbai and Pune as well. That will actually um, result into a 35-minute journey between LA and San Francisco, which otherwise takes about six hours drive. Um, there is already, uh, so Elon Musk is working on Starship as a concept uh, with advanced work, preparatory work already happening, which will move faster than supersonic jet Concorde. And this Starship will cut down the travel time like anything. Can you imagine that New York to Shanghai, which is what, 16-18 hours flight, will take 39 minutes. New York to Shanghai, 39 minutes. Or London to Sydney will be 51 minutes. There is already discussion that, uh, you know, we've all seen that movie called Avatars. There is already a discussion that, you know, Avatars, a multi-purpose robotic avatar that will allow an untrained user to transport their senses and actions over a distance of 100 kilometers or more. So, 
to give this lecture today if i had access to avatars i need not have come here physically you know those holograms which mr modi used once will become reality so at the same time you know uh, this technology uh, and technology developments are opening opportunities like anything here are few jobs that didn't even exist 15 years ago just about 15 years ago and what is also going to happen is that you know we all in our job description will see a change so there may not be a full fledged job of say for example cloud architect or big data scientist but part of our job will require us to uh, be uh, data scientist or you know somewhere we will have to be there even with this requirement there are sh shortages so you don't have enough qualified people who are available so what does this all mean for professions and specifically the accounting profession and that's the third part of my uh, today's uh, uh, deliberation and here is where we need to you know think uh, loud and uh, you know really think hard in a 1906 play called the doctor's dilemma george bernard show said or there was a you know observation which obviously comes out of observation from the society at large where he he says that professions are conspiracies against the public laity was the word that was used and obviously the doctor's dilemma is basically you know about medical profession and the power and prestige and wealth that goes along with that profession because most professions have a guarded wall around them you can't enter the profession just like that i mean on one hand i always find this very uh, ironic that you know uh, ignorance of law is no defense but who can give legal advice only lawyers and that's like you know don't enter my room you're not allowed so professions today all of us would agree that are creaking actually they have become unaffordable the access to first rate professionals is becoming very difficult finest practical expertise has become a scarce commodity obviously some of the professionals or maybe large number of professionals are antiquated they still follow the old ways of producing and sharing experience and you know uh, when uh, you know you visit a court you find that there is an intentional complexity that is being built around that you can't even access that legal system so most professions are underperforming and that is resulting in you know this four questions let me come to that a little later there are four questions that it is uh, raising will there be new ways of organizing professional work that are more affordable more accessible and perhaps more conducive to increase in quality rather than the traditional approach does it follow that all work that our professionals currently do need to be carried out by the licensed experts or is there another mode of delivery that is possible to what extent can we uh, do we actually trust professionals to admit that their service could be delivered differently or some of their work could responsibly passed along to non professionals and i'll give an example of say uh, in in the field of medical if you have an expert system can you rely on a trained nurse rather than a qualified doctor is that an option and are professions serving our society as well in fact i recall and and this is just a reference without any judgment uh, about the whole uh, uh, you know controversy or uh, you know debate about nafra why nafra has come about and we need to really think hard and introspect about it so typically a traditional model of a professional service firms looks like this it's based on leverage it's uh, based on uh, the uh, man hours typically this is how large uh, and even uh, other organizations or uh, professional firms be it uh, lawyers accountants uh, architects they go by what is the rate of recovery per hour 
So what's your chargeable rate? What's your utilization? What's your leverage? Leverage is if you have one partner, how many uh, staff you have per partner, that's the leverage. And so combination of this gives, uh, you know, uh, works out into a profitability model. In fact, uh, David Meister, who, who has written a very famous book called Managing Professional Services Firm, which was published in 1993, has defined that, you know, the type of work into largely three buckets. He says the value proposition for a client, client is seeking a professional uh, service provider, is either they are looking at efficiency or they are looking at expertise or in between experience. And uh, uh, David Meister uh, actually compares this uh, by giving example that when you go to, um, uh, you know, your uh, family physician, that's more an efficiency uh, kind of uh, game. But when you seek out uh, an MD or, or a surgeon, you are actually looking for experience. And when you look out for a neurosurgeon, you are looking for expertise. Now, it's not that expertise is the best model and efficiency is a low model, but your um, the uh, leverage in an efficiency model, you need to have a larger leverage. In fact, if you look at uh, the famous eye hospital in uh, in in uh, uh, yeah Arvind Eye Hospital, they have actually created an efficiency model of treating so many patients in a assembly line model because they have actually um, divided the work into smaller tasks. They've parceled the activities into smaller tasks and what can be done by a trained person rather than a professional is being done by a trained professional. And the doctor has to come and do the final work only. And that is how it is A, building a scale and building, offering a cost efficiency. It's not a, a non-profit hospital, it's a for-profit hospital. So what are the trends that we see in the society? We, we looked at uh, the uh, you know, products uh, from McKinsey and uh, Deloitte. So it's, it's move away from a custom tailored solution to a ready product. There is a need of pressing a demand or requirement to bypass the gatekeepers. Uh, give you another example of uh, you know, this is the uh, third umpire. Now in few years, do you think you need the two umpires? And shift from being reactive to proactive, the more for less challenge, because everybody wants more, everybody has cost pressures. Automation, innovation, emerging skills and competences. Professional work is getting reconfigured. There is decomposition of work that is happening. As I said, you slice and dice the work and only the work where you need to, you know, really sign off with an expert eye, you, you need that. There are new labor arbitrage paraprofessionals. This is actually the word uh, coined. Uh, this is uh, coined by Richard and Daniel Suskin. They have actually written a book uh, uh, which I have uh, taken reference of. Uh, that's called Future of the Professions. And some of these questions, some of this material, is actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I acknowledge uh, that I have, uh, you know, found it very, very uh, thought-provoking. So, Richard and Daniel Suskin have then come out with this question that they see two futures for most professions. In, in the first future, they see that the technology will complement the professional, which means you will become more efficient, uh, you will have tools, you will be able to streamline and optimize your traditional ways of working, but still you will continue to operate in your traditional zone. It's just that you will become that much more capable with the help of technology. So that's one future. And there is a second future. And that substitute increasingly capable systems and machines either operating alone or designed and operated by people who look quite unlike doctors and lawyers, teachers and accountants and others gradually take more of the task that we associated with these traditional professionals. And 
so the technology will substitute professionals these are the two possible scenarios maybe in the medium run both these scenarios will unfold simultaneously but as we see more and more um, growth in terms of technology it will eventually be you know you can't rule out that the powerful machines and systems will take over or at least play a much greater role in in the uh, professions across the board will the jobs be replaced by robots as a result of that again you know it's very uh, tempting to put together everything in one bucket of jobs and and it, when you re really uh, slice that job into different tasks you will find that at a task level automation will be possible however it may not be possible to replace that job completely and therefore to that extent you know human beings will still have the triumph it will become that much more judgmental in fact one debate that is happening is uh, you know in a lot of uh, situations we say that this requires a judgment a human judgment and ai cannot replace human judgment and so the question that it raises is that what do we mean by a judgment is required because you don't have access to full facts and you have to make a conclusion based on whatever limited set of data that is available now when you have proliferation of uh, iot's and sensors and everything would you have data deficiency then and so would there be a situation where because of data deficiency you need a judgment and so ai will continue to become more and more powerful in fact evolution of ai is also a very interesting story uh the discussion around ai started long back many years ago in 1950s uh, there was one uh, workshop that was held 56 if i recall correctly and then uh, during 70s actually the work slowed down and what they call it as the ai winter set in so until about uh, mid to late 80s there was hardly any work that was happening on the ai front and one of the reason that was uh, you know of course the the physical infrastructure in terms of computing power uh, was not adequate at that stage therefore they could not uh, make uh, enough progress but one of the reason given at that point of time was that you know the initial uh, uh, work on the ai was to replicate the way human beings think so uh, for example google has come out with something called as alpha go zero sorry alpha go so initially they came out with alpha go now alpha go plays a game called go which is supposed to be a chess for super human beings it's much more complicated than chess 10 raised to 16 uh, possibilities at a given point of time or something like that now so initial computer was fed with the uh, you know all possible moves or pass history data and that enabled alpha go to beat the best uh, world champion in the game of go and google thereafter in 2017 has come up with something called as alpha go 0 now this alpha go 0 has no such past history it starts with zero and then through its own iteration it builds its own intelligence and then is able to now beat alpha go itself alpha go zero is able to beat alpha go so uh, richard and daniel saskin uh, saskin say that there will be six alternate models of delivering uh, distributing the professional expertise the first he says is network experts model which is workers on tap today you know if you look at every large firm it's basically a, a amalgamation or congruence of smaller teams within they play by certain rules now do you need an umbrella of a firm to access that kind of an expertise is there a, another way I, i'm just Uh, you know trying to make it too simplified but you know can there be an urban clap of chartered accountants 
where you say that you know what your expertise is your expertise is validated you know some kind of a, a combination of airbnb uh, kind of uh, you know uh, rating etc so that's network model how the whole network will get re uh, replaced because today you have traditional network any large firm is a network essentially and can that network be replaced by a technology driven network that's the first alternate second alternate is para professionals we discussed do you need a person who's passed an umpiring exam to stand as umpire or can they be only third umpire and somebody with a little knowledge can also take a call or a nurse a trained nurse can actually help the patients much more efficiently because the intelligent system would have all the resources available third is knowledge engineering so you know when you have a, a diy kind of a software tech software it's given to individuals individuals can plug and play and maybe today's uh, you know uh, individuals or businesses are still not hands on on to that but tomorrow they will be and so the intermediation in all businesses and professions will go away the fourth is communities of experience so you know patients like me for example 600000 patients sharing their own experience can that be a, an alternate as well embedded knowledge now you know when you play for example solitaire uh, if you're playing it manually you can still cheat right when you play on uh, your smartphone can you do the cheating that will be one model and of course the machine generated so that's something we have already discussed and two more questions that uh, emerge out of this and the two first moral question is are there tasks that machines ought not to perform even if they can to give you an example can machine become a judge they may be able to as we saw uh, ebay already uses uh, that uh, you know uh, automation for uh, arbitration now we may say that for civil cases let there be a uh, machine become the judge but in a capital punishment situation would you still allow the uh, machine to perform the task or in a health situation where especially the uh, you know question comes about whether to continue life support system or not so to what extent you would allow permit the uh, machines to you know get into our lives the second question is for example the professional associations in a way own and control the bodies of professional expertise and of course governments regulate them and governments uh, did a good job of not regulating technology so far and that's why we have seen such technical uh, progress but in going forward who would control will the government technology companies it's a very difficult uh, uh, and, uh, you know these are very difficult difficult questions i don't think i have answers uh, i read through the book and the book also didn't have answers but uh, important it is to for us to understand these are emerging questions and so while i may not have answered uh, a question that what should i do going home today or what should i do tomorrow onwards can there be some learning i think the only learning that i have come across is um, somebody made a very uh, fine comment he said that my parents generation they had one qualification and one job throughout our generation has one qualification maybe few jobs trajectories the new generation it will not be sufficient to have one qualification and it will not be sufficient to have one job you will have multiple qualifications you have to continue to reskill yourself 
and if you have observed last two days uh, front page advertisement in economic times that is what it is talking about you learn you unlearn and you relearn so the only message that i have is in this field we need to continue to remain students and i'm sure at bombay chartered accountant societies the office bearers and the team will continue to make sure that adequate resources are made available for you to pursue that i think that's all i have for today thank you so much